Once again, thank you, Pastor Jason, for allowing me to speak today. Um, again, appreciate your leadership and your wisdom. And uh, let's give it up for the Janishes this morning. <laughs> Having some vacation time, hopefully uh, getting uh, rejuvenated. Um, my message today, as you can see on the screen, is titled, Don't Hurry. Live the moment. Don't hurry. Um, but a few weeks ago, uh, when I knew I, knew I was going to be speaking, uh, this was not my message. I had something else planned. And I, uh, I still want to share just the concept of that because uh, we wanted to give you a buy one, get one free today. No, not really. Um, <laughs> but a two for one special. Uh, but I want to share this because uh, it was something God was speaking to my heart, but I think maybe someone needs to hear it. Maybe you're here today, maybe you're watching online. And the basic concept is this um, you know, we're in the new year, um, and, we're, and we're all about like looking ahead. You know, and everyone's using the cliche 2020 vision, you know, and, and all of that. Um, and we look ahead, and, and, and certainly, you know, that's true. We need to do that. We need to look forward to the promises. And, um, but in the midst of that, we're like, we're looking back and we're saying, okay, you know, what can we do better? Um, because, you know, like I messed up here. I made these mistakes. I went through this difficult time. Bad things happened to people that I love. Bad things happened to me. Um, uh, but now this year, things are going to be better, and it's almost like, you know, let's, uh, let's run as fast as we can from that um, and press on forward to the next thing. And, uh, but in that, I, I want us to find some encouragement, because I believe this is what God was speaking to my heart and wants to speak to some hearts this morning, is that, you know, we hear that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the beginning. He's the end. And in our concept of time, we've got the, you know, the past, the present, and the future. The things that you've gone through, the things that have happened, the mistakes that you've made that are in your past. I don't think time matters to God. He's still working. So he's the God who goes before us, but he's the God who's working behind us. He's the God who uh, can use the situations that we've gone through, and he's still in the whole space of time, he's still cultivating things. He's back there in our past by his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, the things that have happened, and he's working all things together for his glory. And so I want that to be an encouragement to you. Don't be so quick to run from the past, but in a sense, in hindsight, have faith and know that, that God is still working. You know, we can sit there and we can have like all these regrets. I should have done better or now I'm going to do better. Um, but God is working. And, and so that was going to be my message. That's the super uh, shorted portion of it, um, that God um, is still working behind you. Um, yes, he's working in front of you, but he's also working behind you. Um, and now we will move on to today's actual sermon. Um, I need some crowd participation um, you guys are fairly decent clappers. I would say about 57% of you are decent clappers. Um, and so I, I need you to... Um, you can sing along too. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Keep going. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't hurry. Mm -hmm. Be happy. All right, that's it. Uh, you guys are good. That's, I won't uh, torture you any longer. Uh, don't hurry. Be happy. I know the lyric is really don't worry. Be happy. I do know that. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the negative effects of hurry. And one of the things, one of those things is worry. When we're in such a hurry, hurry causes worry. Think about it. When you're in a hurry to get to a destination on time or you're in the drive through uh, you're worried about if, um, if you're going to get there on time, if you're going to be late. You're, you're worried about if your food's going to be cold, if, if they accidentally maybe gave your order to someone else and you're going to get the wrong items. Is you're worried it's going to take forever to get your food. And as a matter of fact, it's said that we here in America are a fast food nation. We're a fast food nation, and I don't think that's just because we consume so many burgers and fries and tacos. I think uh, that it's just because we want stuff, and we want it now. 
We want it right now. We don't want to wait. And uh, we just finished up uh, that Willy Wonka series in December. And if you remember the scene with uh, Veruca Salt, she's like, Daddy, I want a pony and I want it now. And he's like, just wait, Veruca, as soon as we get home, then I'll get you a pony. No, I want it now. <laughs> Matthew 6.34 says this, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, <laughs> for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That sounds like kind of a depressing verse at first, right, to start your day with. I can just picture Eeyore getting out of, you know, I might as well not get out of bed. Today's going to have enough trouble of its own. But <laughs> it's, not meant, it's not meant to be a dirge. <laughs> it's really not meant to be a dirge. It's, it's actually, if you read the whole uh, verse, Jesus is offering a message of hope and of encouragement. In this verse, Jesus is saying, trust me, you spend so much time worrying, but don't you realize that if you trust me, I will provide exactly what you need for today. And of course, that doesn't mean that we don't plan, that we don't make wise choices, but it does mean that we do not have to carry the burden of worry. Jesus says, cast your cares on me, for I care for you. He says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why did he use a yoke as the metaphor? Jesus knows, he realizes that we have work to do, that life is hard, that we have to labor and toil. And Jesus, he has work for us to do. He even rewards the fruit of our labor, of our diligence, and he says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. He has work for us to do. He knows we're moving along on a journey and that this life will be filled with troubles. But he says, stop trying to pack everything into your backpack your own way. You've got so much stuff and, and you're trying to pack it in and you're, you're cramming stuff in there and you're, you're trying to balance it, but it, it's top heavy. It's not balanced and, and you can't carry it. Wear my yoke for my burden is like, trust me. He's saying, put your trust in me. Wear my yoke. I will provide you the strength, the wisdom, and the things you need to get through. As a matter of fact, he says, seek first my kingdom, and all these other things will be added. Yes, this is the first Sunday of 2020, and I know there are plenty of verses in the Bible that talk about setting our sights ahead. Pressing on toward the goal. Forgetting what's behind, fleeing from evil, and on and on. And generally, that's kind of the message I like to hear. You know, that's the message uh, we all like to hear at the beginning of the new year because it motivates us. It motivates us. We usually like to hear things like, I know 2019 was hard. It was a tough year. Some bad things happened. We made some mistakes, but we can learn from our mistakes. All that's behind us now. Let's focus on what's ahead. Better days are coming. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We need to have a positive outlook. We need to strive to do better. We need to set goals. But might I suggest that this year in 2020 that we begin to slow down just a little bit? Because we might be so focused on getting to the next stage in life, the next stage even in our spiritual walk, that we're missing out on what God has for us right now, what he has for us today. We were watching uh, the New York City ball drop on New Year's Eve on, on TV this past Tuesday, and uh, they were interviewing people from all over the world who were standing there. They're like, how long have you been here? And so like, I've been here for three weeks. Not really. They weren't there that long, but they're like, you know, 24 hours. I've been here for, you know, uh, 48 hours um, with my friends and my family, uh, just waiting to ring in the new year. And, uh, the con and they were from all over the world. But the common theme was it's going to be a new start. Things are going to be better in 2020. Things were tough for us in 2019, but the past is behind us. 2020 is going to be better. We have hope for humanity. And all this anticipation, it kept building and building. And people were uh, just getting all excited and, and, and rushing to get to that moment where they would count down. You guys count with me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 
two, one. Whoa, happy new year. Whoa, you hear like the crowd roaring and the confetti is uh, going up and everything seems like it's in slow motion for just a minute and uh, people are standing there just mesmerized and uh, suddenly uh, friends hug and lovers kiss and uh, child's just standing there staring at everything and, 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 and slowly the music fades and, and the screen fades to black. Now what? <laughs> like it's done. It's over. The rush is over. Everyone packs up their belongings. They leave all their trash on the ground for someone else to pick up. And it's like back to reality. Back to the life they were already living. And we often say this. The best is yet to come. Better days are ahead. And absolutely, that's a promise of God's word. God has great things in store for us. He has plans and promises. But don't forget, he has good things for you right now. He has good things for you right now. Yes, God has good things for you right now. He wants to teach you things in this moment you're in right now. And that's why we're taught to approach him with a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving. It says, in everything, give thanks. God, thank you for giving me today. Thank you for providing for my spirit and my soul, your daily bread. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my friends. Thank you for my job. Thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you for food. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all the things that have gone good. Thank you for being there beside me, holding my hand through the bad times. When we're in a hurry, we miss out. We miss out on what God wants to teach us. We miss out on the moments, the blessings, the opportunities at hand. Every moment is a blessing from God. Yes, we deal with some moments that we wish we didn't have to go through. For some of you, some very horrific moments. But God says, I'm here with you now. I'm walking with you in this moment. Put your hand in mine. Put your trust in me. So whether you're walking through the valley or whether you're up on the mountaintop, I'm here. I have something for you. I've already won the battle, he says. And in the end, you win too. There's love, joy, peace available to you in every moment of your journey. So stop running. Stop just trying to run from things. Stop Stop just trying to get by. Stop trying to just survive. He wants us to thrive. Stop looking for the next means of fulfillment. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. When we're in a hurry, we're much more prone to making mistakes, to overlooking things, to forgetting about how the things that we're doing affect others. I used to work uh, in a jewelry store, and people would bring in their jewelry, which is very sentimental. Uh, jewelry holds very sentimental value to people, whether it's an heirloom that was passed down from uh, a grandparent or a parent, a loved one. Um, of course, wedding, anniversary, and um, they hold meanings to special moments, and, and there's just so much about so it's very precious. Yes, you know, gold and diamonds and all that stuff might be valuable, but many times the value is way greater than that because of the sentiment with it. And so people would bring things in because they have an event coming up. Maybe they have an anniversary they're celebrating or a graduation party or a retirement party. And uh, they wanted to wear this special necklace, but uh, it was all dirty and corroded. And so they just wanted to bring it in and have it cleaned. And um, especially it seemed like uh, during the summer months when weddings had happened, those, were not, those are now anniversaries, so that was a very busy time. And then, of course, like the holidays when families get back together and there's Christmas parties and, and all of that. And so you would just have this tremendous workload, and you could feel the pressure. And it was always very cautious, very careful. It's very tedious work, uh, some of it microscopic work. And uh, but I would have this uh, buffing wheel and polishing their jewelry, and, and you had to use slow, careful movements, paying 100% attention to what you were doing because, uh, number one, if a chain got wrapped up and you were holding it in your hand, it could rip a finger off. It could uh, completely destroy the chain. And, um, and there were a couple of times where, uh, you know, 
you're just stressed out because you're so busy and people have deadlines. They need their stuff by a certain time. And uh, for a split second, I would stop paying attention and I would push a little too hard and that wheel would grab that necklace and it would uh, just wrap it up on the spindle and the thing would bust into half a dozen pieces. Someone's sentimental heirloom destroyed. Have to call them and tell them what happened. How many of us are, are getting tangled up in things because we're in such a hurry to get somewhere. We're in such a hurry to meet our goals that we become careless. We start to overlook things. We put our own needs, our own wants, our own desires before the needs of others or before what God actually wants for us. We become so set on doing things our own way or um, maybe we even do them with selfish motives that we no longer rely on God. However, then we, you know, we end up messing up uh, we completely miss out on what God has for us at the present time, and uh, maybe we even blame. We blame God for our situation. We're in a rush. We're in a rush to catch the next rush. And what is it that we really want? What is it? I would say that the majority of us in this room would agree on one of the things that we all want, and that is happiness. We want to be happy. We want that fulfillment. We want purpose. And that fulfillment and purpose, it brings us happiness and joy, and, um, and we want that. At the end of the day, we want it for us, really, um, because we want to feel complete. We want to feel happy. And that's the number one thing people want in life, happiness. We chase after it. We run after it. That's why it's called the pursuit of happiness. And the irony of the entire situation is that we're in such a hurry chasing after things that we believe will make us happy that we end up missing out on the moments that really matter, that we would really find fulfillment in. The moments that God is providing for us. He provides every moment we have, every second, every breath we take as a gift from him. If we would just slow down and open our eyes, we would recognize his blessings at hand. We would begin to experience his true joy in our lives. We're driven by so much hurry that we end up with just a load of worry. Worrying if we've made the right choices. Worrying if the next thing we're chasing after is finally going to be the answer. And this is what I want us to get today, that hurry is not compatible with the life Jesus has for you. Hurry is not compatible with the life Jesus has for you. Jesus has a life of fullness for you. And in a sense, yes, he wants you to be happy. But contrary to what the world would have us believe, to what the product and marketing industry is shoving in our face, that happiness does not come from monetary things. Galatians 5.22 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, against such things, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit. Growing fruit takes time. It means sitting at the feet of Jesus. It means spending time in his word. It means singing his praises. It means talking to him. It means that we open the spiritual ears of our heart and we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the still, small voice. And maybe you're like, I've, I've never heard it. I haven't heard the voice of God. He wants to speak to you. Jesus wants you to experience the fruit of the Spirit in your life, and that growth takes time. Hurry is not compatible with the life Jesus has for you. Corey Tenboom said this, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. If the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. I'm sure most of you know who Corey Ten Boom is. Uh, she, um, her father and her siblings, uh, her whole family. Um, this was during World War II um, in uh, the concentration camps. And uh, um, the, they lived where, you know, all the Nazis were. And so they were uh, setting up refuge uh, for the Jewish people. And uh, they would bring them in and they would... Uh, uh, provide a roof over their head, protection for them. They would get food vouchers to uh, give them food and, and meet their needs. And uh, they were all doing this right under the nose of the government. 
and uh, eventually some other governments who wanted to help with humanitarian efforts and, and put an end to this even sent in an architect uh, to help them build a secret room under their house. And came in, they did that, and uh, this went on, and they helped enormous amounts of people. Uh, she wrote a, a book called The Hiding Place, and uh, it documents her family's humanitarian efforts and the hope she found after they were finally arrested. Uh, they were arrested by the Nazis, uh, thrown in a concentration camp. They released her dad and her siblings, but they kept her in solitary confinement for months. And uh, she wrote this book called The Hiding Place, and it documents their humanitarian efforts and the hope she found while being imprisoned in that concentration camp. So she was no stranger to patience, perseverance, and time in general. And I find it fascinating uh, that when I was reading some information on her, that her and her dad were also watchmakers. So she understood time. She understood it on a mechanical level, but she also understood it on a perseverance level. So when she says... Phrases like, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And then understanding her background and where she was from, there's some incredible depth, experience, and wisdom associated with that statement. This past uh, week, I've been uh, reading um, just a very simple uh, devotional in the Bible app. You can download it from the uh, app store on your phone or, or uh, smart device. And uh, the Bible app, and it's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by a guy named John Mark Comer. And he talks about three things. Well, that's two. There we go. Three things. Talks about three things uh, that Jesus wants for you that will ultimately bring you that fulfillment, that true happiness that you're seeking. However, hurry is their enemy. And he says this, hurry isn't necessarily a sin, but he says this, sin and busyness have the same effect on our spiritual life. They cut off our connection to God, other people, and our own soul. So the first thing he says is this, hurry is incompatible with love. Love takes time. You can't rush love. Oh yes, we've all heard of, and some of us in this room have experienced Love at first sight. But when that wears off, what is true love? True love takes time. We read about love in 1 Corinthians. It says, starts out, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love goes through the fire. It goes through the fire. It is committed. Love is committed. It takes time, and it stands the test of time. Parents in this room, you know that loving your children takes time and energy. There are no shortcuts. You cannot buy love. When it comes to lasting friendships, lifelong friends realize that love takes time. It takes time to nurture, express, and to do love well. Paul, in that opening verse, he started out with, love is patient. You'll be tested many times throughout each day. We all are. When you're in the middle of something and, and you've got to get it done and then there's an interruption, will you hurry and rush through that interruption, that moment to just hurry up and get back to what you're doing? Or will you stop and take time to give your attention to the child who's trying to show you a picture they drew for you? Or take a phone call from that friend who you know is going through a difficult time and, and they need a listening ear, they need some advice. Love takes time. Hurry is incompatible with love. Don't hurry, slow down, do love well. The second thing is this, hurry is incompatible with joy. The Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is not just a one-time download. It doesn't just hit us in the face in some expected way. I'm not saying it can't do that. But the joy of the Lord comes from sitting at his feet. It comes from spending time in his presence. 
Many times we want to escape our trials and our hardships. It's a, it's a natural thing. We want to escape those things. And we, we want to escape them because we want to experience joy. We want to leave those trials, those hardships behind so that we can be moved from that situation into a moment of joy. But James tells us that when we face trials and temptations, that we should consider those things joy. What? How can we do that? In James uh, chapter 1, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, don't rush through the trials. Stay in the fire. There's a purification process that is taking place. Let your situation produce faith and perseverance. Stay and let your faith mature. Be ready to open your heart, um, open your hands, surrender to God, and accept the provisions he has for you in those moments. Isaiah 61.3 says, The Lord gives joy for mourning. And he says, the writer says that when we clothe ourselves with a garment of praise, that it combats a spirit of heaviness. You can't rush through your situations and just escape them, boom, and then experience joy. It takes time. The third thing is this. Hurry is incompatible with peace. Love, joy, peace. Hurry is incompatible with peace. And I have to be honest, it's hard for me, it's hard for me to experience peace when we have to go somewhere. Is, are my, where are my kids? <laughs> when we have to go somewhere as a family. We have seven kids, my wife and I, and we have a 12-passenger van, and it's a little bit hard to experience peace in our house when we have somewhere to be and be there by a certain time. We can't be late. And we're like, get dressed, get dressed, get dressed. Uh, we told you to get dressed 20 minutes ago. Why are you sitting on the floor in your underwear? Get dressed. All right, shoes on. Out to the car, out to the van. Everybody get in the van. Halfway out. Why do you only have one shoe on? Why are you playing in the snow? You're supposed to be in the van. Get in the van. Get in there. We have to get to church. <laughs> in the van, and here we are, Sunday morning. Here we are. <laughs> I know we are the only family that deals with that, and I just completely ripped it open wide for you all to see. But it's hard to find peace in those moments. And then, like, oh, and then we get back home, and, you know, the neighbor's that live right on either side of our driveway are like, oh, where were you guys? We're at church. Yeah, we were at church. What do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Yeah, you should come and check us out sometime. And they're like, all right. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Exhale slowly. If you want the peace God offers to us, you have to slow down. You have to slow down. You have to stop. You have to be still. Don't cram so much stuff into your schedule. In John 14, Jesus starts telling the disciples about what to expect uh, after he was going to leave, after the crucifixion, resurrection, and then he was talking to them about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And he says this, All this I have spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. And then he says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The world gives with conditions. If you do this, then you can experience this. If you, uh, you know... We have this, you know, it's on sale right now. You purchase this, and you'll finally be able to experience what you want. And it's a lie. They're selling a lie. And the world wants to move at a fast pace. Everything is just progressing and moving faster and faster and faster, and um, slow is bad, fast is good. 
The world says if you chase after this, this, and this, you'll finally be happy. And my wife and I sometimes have some conversations, and I think we've all tossed around this idea or said it, you know, man, what, was, you know, what would it be like just to live like 100 years ago without all the fast-paced technology? And I get it. Like, people didn't live as long because they didn't have the medicine that we have now, the medical advances, and there were horrific things that happened. But in that same hand, I think people really understood and embraced what was important. People moved at a much slower pace. And now it's just like the, the speed of light. I never believed it. My parents always told me when I was a kid, you're, I'm telling my kids this, parents tell these kids and they don't believe it. They're like, I just can't wait to you know, get into college, graduate, be on my own, meet that person. And, and it seems like it's gonna take forever. And now all of a sudden you're 41 years old and your oldest is 16 and like, whoa, where did time go? Jesus says, slow down. He says, quiet your soul. Take time to smell the sweet fragrance of my presence. Fast in the kingdom is bad, slow is good. Hurry is incompatible with peace. And as we're talking about love, joy, and peace, these are not simply just emotions that we experience and feel. These are conditions of our heart. Love, joy, and peace is a condition of our heart. They're actually part, they become part of our character. They're traits that are grown in our lives as we slow down and spend time with Jesus. They are part of the sanctification process that the Holy Spirit is accomplishing in the life of each and every believer. And I like what the author of this devotion, John Mark Comer, says, um, they aren't just pleasant feelings they are the kinds of people we become through our apprenticeship to Jesus. True happiness is found in the love, the joy, and the peace that Christ offers. Those things take time, and you can't have them, you can't take hold of them, you can't experience them if you're constantly just running to the next thing. You have to be present, you have to be now, you have to be here. Biblical scholars, spiritual masters from all different religions, not just Christianity, secular and Christian psychologists, there's one thing that they all agree on. Every one of them agrees on, and it's that the single simplest secret <laughs> to happiness is being present in the moment. Being present in the moment. And we're so quick, you know, to give God our future. And that's good, that's fine. We need to trust him with our future. And even though I, I get that it's hard, I'm not saying it's easy to trust them with our future, but it's a little bit easier to trust them with our future because we simply don't have it. We don't know what it is. We don't, we're not holding the future. All we have is now. And are we trusting him with right now, with the present that we're in right now? Happiness is not out there somewhere waiting for you. It's not out there waiting for you. That might be a little discouraging to some people who are on the pursuit to find it. But if you can't get to the place where you are happy in the moment that you're in, you're never going to experience happiness. You're never going to be happy. You have to learn to experience and receive the love, the joy, and the peace, the, the traits that God offers us that bring us true happiness in the moment, regardless of what the moment is. So stop the rush. Don't hurry. I'm going to close with this uh, story out of uh, Luke chapter 10 as the worship team comes back this morning. Uh, it's the story of Martha and Mary. And I'm just going to read through it. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. 
but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and I will, it will not be taken away from her. The story about Martha and Mary can teach us much about slowing down. Martha, was, she was so busy getting things ready for Jesus and his disciples uh, that she was running around like a chicken with her head cut off, missing out on the fellowship, the community, the friendship of Jesus and his disciples. And she became distracted, worried, and, and stressed out with all of her preparations, all which were meant for good. She was doing good things to prepare what she thought was right and what she thought was needed. But she became so wrapped up in that that she even became angry and frustrated with her own sister because her sister wasn't helping her with the things she thought was important. And Jesus was saying, Martha, Martha, slow down. You don't need to be in such a hurry. It's nice that you want to do all this stuff for me, but I just want to spend some time with you. I want to get to know you, and I I want you to get to know me. And so my question for us this morning is this. Are we a Martha or are we a Mary? And yes, I know we have things to do. This message is not a license or any kind of encouragement to say, hey, you guys just need to be lazy and do nothing. And I think you realize that. We need to work hard. We need to work diligently, but we need to slow down. Don't overlook the importance of spending time with your Savior. Don't overlook the people around you He has called us and designed us for fellowship with himself and with others. And you can't hurry it. You can't rush it. He has so much for you right now in this moment. And he has ministry for you to do right now. If you rush, if you run, if you hurry, you're going to miss it. John Maxwell coined this phrase, walk slowly through the crowd. I've heard this used by various speakers and and preachers. Walk slowly through the crowd. and He tells the story about a guy named Dan uh, who worked for him. I believe he was also in ministry. And uh, this guy, Dan, uh, was a leader. Uh, People looked up to him. He was very wise. And uh, one day, Dan came into work and walked right past John and and the rest of his coworkers standing out in the lobby briefcase in hand and just kind of walked quickly right past them, uh, down the hall, turned into his office. And then uh, John Maxwell went, knocked on his door and was like, "Uh, Dan, you know, what's up? Why are you, you didn't even say hi to us or anything. You just walked right past us. And and Dan replied, I've got a lot to do. I've got so much to get done and I just need to get in here, get to work and get it done. And uh, John replied, well, you just walked past your work. You just walk past your work. And, and then he told him, never forget that ministry is about people. Ministry is about people. And, and so you might be here today and you're like, okay, that's great, but I'm not a minister. <laughs> I'm not in ministry. I'm not even, uh, I'm not leading anything at church or, uh, but I have news for you. Every single one of us in this room is in ministry. You're in ministry to your family. You're in ministry to your, your friends, to your coworkers, in your workplace, in, in your school place. When you are shopping at the marketplace, you are in ministry. Walk slowly through the crowd. Don't be so task-driven that you, you pass by the opportunities and the doors that God has that he wants to open for you. Love, joy, peace. Don't hurry. Don't hurry it. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Um, I thank you for uh, speaking this message to my heart. Um, And I just pray that you would um, help me to slow down. I pray the same thing for um, people all across this room that uh, even like was shared today during worship, that uh, we would see these moments that you have right now, that uh, these moments that you have us in, and uh, that we would uh, just stop with a heart of surrender. We say, God, here I am. I'm here in your presence. I'm here at your feet. I might be in a horrible situation. I might be on the mountaintop. I might things might be going great. Either way, would you provide your love, your joy, your peace in my life? That it can be a testimony that 
I don't miss out on the things that you have right now. Because that's what's going to prepare us and equip us for the future. So we need that. We need those provisions right now in our lives. Would you do your work in our hearts this morning, Lord? We pray this in your name. Everyone said amen. Amen. Would you guys uh, stand with uh, us this morning as the worship team leads us in the song?